The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I have leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll sell Obviously, be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process, and hopefully, you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors, or simply download the app. Dash was formed in April 2022 following a merger with financial planning software firm Raw Software, wealth platform software specialist Neo, and platform technology provider Wealtho2. Dash is the first advice technology company to focus on solving problems across the end to end advice process. Dash helps. Dash's modular approach allows advisors to tailor their best of breed tech stack helping streamline processes and leaving advisors time to focus on maintaining their clients' experience. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm pumped to be here with Maddie Hale. Maddie's the Managing Director at Rising Tide Financial uh, down in the great state of Victoria. Matt, good to have you, mate. Thanks for having me, Ben. Oh, mate, it's good to be chatting and it's uh, definitely been way too long, but i um, I know that you guys have been on a journey like your your business has gone through a, a, a lot of sort of growth and um, evolution team, you know, structure, transition. So I'm keen to to unpack that and, and pull out some of the lessons. Uh, for anyone that hasn't or you know, that isn't familiar with that journey, can you uh, maybe just talk us through, you know, how you've ended up where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I'm about to tick over 17 years in the industry and all at Rising Tide. I was the first employee back um, back when it all started um, under my former mentor and business partner, uh, Chris Brown. And the business really started off in that old school super insurance. We, you know, would charge 1.1%. We'd do a lot of insurance and that's where we came from. And that was really close to my heart uh, because I came from a family where insurance wasn't there when when it was probably needed the most. And my mum underwent a lot of medical stuff, which just put a lot of pressure on the family. So insurance was always something that I really lent into. Over the years, you know, the industry changed. We became a bit more conscious in what we wanted to do and that led us to working a lot uh, with you know JetX and Gen Ys, as we called them back in the day, very much accumulators now to the point where 91% of our fee paying clients are between the age of uh, 31 and 54. We transitioned from, as I said, super insurance to a lot more holistic advice and very driven uh, people, well, you know, our team and our clients, debt plays a really big part as well. So over the past 10 years, we've built a lending team uh, you know, heavily driven by by one of my close mates and, and our business partner Sam, and that's sort of you know, that's the back of the elevator, uh, back of the envelope, sort of, yeah, rising tide history. Nice. So uh, I got hooked up with Brownie when he was involved in the AFA, as I know you were as well uh, back in the day, and I think that um, the the evolution and transition around the business, like obviously, is there from the start, big driving force. Um, ended up, you know, had a uh, change of direction, some stuff that he needed to do, family things and um, moved out of advice and you sort of transitioned to take over uh, the driving of the business. And since that time, you've grown the business further and brought um, a few more people in the mix. Can you just talk us through how that all played out? Yeah, certainly a lot of it wasn't by design initially and that's been my biggest learning throughout the journey is that you really need to make sure that you're clear on what you want to achieve and and our business was growing just on sheer hard work and then, you know, uh, 
FOFA came along and the Royal Commission, and it was at that, about that point in time where Chris um, had to leave the business to look after his family, two kids with, um, you know, that are on the spectrum. So that that really forced his hand at the age of 40. And I think at that point in time, talking about succession planning at the age of 40 was not even on the radar. You know, we've even seen recently that it's become more of an issue with all the facio changes and everything that's going on at the moment. So Chris was forced to do some succession planning and that led me to, I suppose, always wanting to face my work in mortality. You know, we work so hard to build a career and build an asset uh, and, you know, work so hard for our clients that want to make sure that it perpetuates me and, and it's an enduring business, but also that my family can get out of rising tide uh, if and when we need to. Yeah, it's an interesting one. And I we were just chatting a bit before we fired up the recording and uh, something I hadn't thought about too much, although like I have, uh, we've got key people in the business and we're looking at how you know, what the future looks like, but I hadn't thought about it from that, you know, things can happen and change quite quickly. Um, how did you, like, especially given how sort of like sort of abrupt that was, like how did you tackle things and and figure out, you know, what you were going to do, how it was all going to work, and then looking forward from there, what, what would come next? Yeah, look, the, the thing that I learned was that, the rapport and the relationships that I built across the journey was so important. And it's a little bit like with clients where people, you know, go in too early for the kill, for want of a better word. And Chris and I were great mates, but I'd seen a lot of people that were in business together that were great mates fall out. And so that was actually the most important part for me. And, and it's continually been the most important part that I want people and me to reflect on my relationships you know, in a business sense, but also in a life sense that there's no bridges burned. And so when Chris came to me and it was literally, you know, not one word of a lie, you know, a one page letter saying, unfortunately, mate, I feel I need to get out. And this is the number. Um, and we, you know, had some pretty robust discussions, but we managed to get it done. And then after we shaken hands, we formalized it. And, and all the key people at Rising Tide, particularly Sam Gwenda, who, who, you know, ran our lending business at the time and is now my sort of co-pilot, we just did everything we could to try to get it out of it what everyone needed. Uh, your question about the transition, we actually saw that as a ground zero. Uh, and, and, you know, for a lot of people, they're starting a business from scratch. We felt like we were starting a business with a business that was consistently profitable. We had the real guts of, of a good culture, but it wasn't exactly where we wanted it to be. And, and I think at one point in time, we sort of reflected on the fact that the advice team was all guys. And, you know, particularly Sam, myself and, and Chris previously, we'd all had incredible female role models in our life. And we wanted to bring that to our clients world and also the proximity to Rising Tide to really ramp that up. And so we became more conscious, I think, you know, we, we looked at what we wanted our vision to be. We looked at where our skill sets were. We brought on some people to help us in areas that Chris probably had left a bit of a gap. Uh, you know, at this point in time, I think, you know, we're all sort of under the age of 31. So it was all happening pretty quick and, you know, I had to go and start negotiating with banks and licensees and, you know, everyone gets a little bit scared when the, you know, one of the key revenue generators and key equity holders pulls the ripcord pretty quickly. So mm. learn a fair bit in the art of diplomacy and negotiation in a pretty quick period. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Um, I think like looking at your business as well that the the actual what you guys do has has gone through some changes because you were involved in accounting in the early days uh, now you've got a heavy focus to mortgage broking like how did you figure out what what was working or where your time was best spent focusing on and and building that because I think like even for my business I've thought about like debt as a as a thing it seems like natural we work closely with the number of mortgage brokers and debt is such an integral part of the strategy for accumulators there's an argument that tax is as well and i sort of oscillate between um you know trying to find good people to help with that and thinking that we should do it ourselves what uh what were the lessons learned for you guys there yeah the lessons are and if i sort of go to the mortgage broken side of things we're really clear on two things we wanted to have a diversified income stream and we were sort of sitting there uh, looking at our own advice to people, talking about well-diversified portfolios and we had financial planning, which at that point in time was heavily geared around insurance. So we, we knew we needed to upskill to improve our, our financial planning diversity, our, our upfront and our ongoing 
fees and engagements and then you know from a mortgage broking point of view um, and we're also really clear on who we wanted to work with you know the part that is really hard to nail and I think we've been able to do it is getting the right people uh, but you know we were probably you know got some dumb luck there but we're also really clear on what we wanted to achieve and and then the other learning is and it goes back to um, to accounting and you know we were working with someone that you know that was a good friend and that it all looked like it should work but then when we really sort of separated ourselves four or five years later we looked at what the rising tide financial planning and lending side of things what the our absolute ideal bread and butter client was and that's not just age that's demographic, psychographic, you know, everything about them, their journey, how they talk, how they walk. Um, and it was effectively, it was a, you know, it was in complete contrast to what the accounting business needed. So that made that decision, put all people and, you know, and feelings aside, it made that decision in the end really easy to do. Um, you know, the process of consciously uncoupling, for want of a better word, is not easy, um, but I think when you've got a really clear driver around what you're trying to achieve, be it personally or in the business, it makes those sacrifices and those conversations a lot easier. Yeah, I think it's a tricky one with accounting because for like we do a lot of work with accumulators as well and in that space, it's like people want you know, X, Y, Z, they want someone to coach them around what they can deduct and be smart with their tax strategy. And there's a lot of crossover with what we do on the financial planning side, but then they need a solution to do their tax return. And it's any good accountants or most good accountants, they, unless they're really tech led, they, they don't want to play in that space either. So um, it does, does make it a bit difficult that we would use a premium solution that charge what you'd consider a premium price but they're still probably not charging enough to deliver what people want and then you're sort of you know pushing shit uphill a bit when it comes to um getting there so i don't know what the what the future holds for that because people still do need their their tax returns done but i suppose with something like that it is does draw a lot of focus from what you're doing as a business as well and i think you know applying that to mortgage broking that's that's probably been the barrier for us that i'm nervous and concerned that in the past i've fallen into the trap of splitting our focus too far and then you end up having to sacrifice in you know core elements of the business how for you guys how have you managed that in a way to to ensure that you can deliver a good solution around mortgage broking continue to deliver a great solution around advice um, and for it not to be a distraction. Yeah, there's a lot there to unpack. I think the most simplistic way I think about it is I look at, and I've always looked at sporting teams, uh, and, and if you look at sport at the elite level, you know, let's use um, let's use soccer. You know, there'll be a manager of, of the team, and then there'll be line coaches. And I think that, you know, we made a conscious decision to make the business big enough that we could have, you know, a good combination of that. So we, you know, we have people in our business that I'd say are great at helping people around the technical things, around the advice, around the technology. Um, you know, there's still a lot of gaps probably around the technology piece, but that seems to be a common occurrence in the industry. But but just getting big enough to be able to not feel like we were always trying to solve today's problems. And that's the learning that I sort of had you know, across the journey as we've brought new equity partners in, we've extracted others that it takes bandwidth um, and, and I suppose it's no different to an advisor where it might get to a point where they need to choose what their role is and probably at one point you might be able to do investment, insurance, maybe even some lending, um, you know, retirement. But I think if you're going to grow at some point, you need to work out what your one would is um, and then find the right people to help you get where, uh, where you think the business needs to go and actually get their buy-in to help sort of, you know, get a bit more clarity on what it looks like for everyone because you, you really need that buy-in. Mm. And talking of good people, I feel like it's something that you guys have done really well. You've got a great team. I just saw your um, post pop up that you got three uh, three of the top 50 most influential advisors in your business uh, just on the advice side and then you've got a, a significant team on the mortgage side as well. How have you gone about finding great people you know, onboarding them well or like integrating them well into the business to make sure that, you know, that works, delivers the business outcomes, delivers what they want as well. Yeah, and this will 
talk back to my my days as you know completely dealing in client land and i firmly believe that the key to success in advice is is juggling these three balls it's it's finding it it's delivering it and it's servicing and i think a lot of the time people will drop one of those balls you know they spend a lot of time trying to find it and their implementation might drop off and then you know they, they're not servicing so that's the mindset that i always have is that we need to be consistently looking for new talent like as an example i think you know uh, rebecca pritchard who joined us close on four years ago the conversation that i had with her when i was uh, one of the judges in the rising star that she happened to win. I knew she was very happy at, at a place of employment at the time, but I said, all I ask is that if that changes, can I please be the first person that you have a conversation with? Not promising anything, it may lead to anything, it may lead to nothing. Um, mm. And I think being really conscious around that. Uh, and then, you know, as we've tried to build more, um, I suppose, a deeper culture, there's some of it's been really conscious, some of it's been around sort of, you know, the understanding the psychology of people. You know, as an example, we're, we're looking for a couple of PY candidates at the moment. Uh, one to work with, with Sam Jewell and one to work with Rebecca. And, you know, I think yesterday we would have just put something on seek, whereas now we're a bit more, I suppose, guarded in who we let into the tent, but also we're a bit clearer in who we want to invite in. Mm. And how did you get that clarity? Part of it is looking around where, you know, you've got those skills skills gaps. Um, I think, you know, we use disk profiling or a couple of things in that space, which just helps to understand the language that people are talking, not just when things are going well, but when they're under pressure. Um, and then I think we are always open. You know, I think that's something that we've always done really well and I've got a bit more time to do it now than, than I used to is just be open and having conversations and share and, give people an understanding of who we are and what we do and, and not just sort of, you know, the bullshit that pops up on the website, really giving people an understanding into who we are, our vulnerabilities, what we're trying to achieve, what makes us tick. Uh, and then I think I think there's a certain element of people can feel that authenticity. Absolutely, yeah. I, I think it's it's funny, like, because we, we've been hiring, you know, a number of people over the last little while, a couple of years in particular, and it blows me away that you do these interviews with people and you, obviously they're looking for a job. That's why you're sitting in an interview and you say, well, what's why have you left? You obviously want to understand the motivations, like what's what's driving their, their need for change. And it blows me away how many people say, oh, it wasn't really what I was expecting. And it's like, hold on a sec, like um, – I get that when you're going for an interview, you generally want to, you know, give yourself the opportunity of getting a job. But I feel like it's it's sort of like you want to make sure that you understand what's going to be expected of you, how it's going to work. And I know that you can only get so much from an interview, but like some of the things are just so clear that you go like, didn't you ask more questions or didn't they tell you more about how things were going to work? Because for us, when we interview someone, we, as much as we want to, we don't want them to do it in an arrogant way. We want them to be interviewing us to make sure that they understand the role, the expectations, the business, the team, how it's all going to flow so that they can get comfortable. And it's our job to make sure that we think that they can deliver, but it's their job to make sure that they they want to deliver what we want them to deliver as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I reckon I can nail it in, in three words. You know, confidence, competence, and curiosity. And I think if one of those three are lacking you know, whether it be confidence. And we've all sat there in those interviews and, and mate, I'd be, you know, if I'm sitting there in, in an interview with you, you're accomplished, you know, you know what you want to achieve. I'd, I'd probably, my confidence might might be lacking at times. And so that's the really hard part about trying to find out how you get the, the best out of most people. But then equally on the flip side, you're sort of looking at it from a business point of view and go, we actually need, we need the herd heading in the right direction. Um mm. I, I think for Rising Tide and for me in particular, you know, if there's one overarching learning, it is those things that need bandwidth that are so often neglected that can have an indirect, uh, you know, impact. And, and that could be really thinking about, you know, who you love spending time with, be from, and this could be client value proposition, employee value proposition, just who you want in your corner. Um, and then also overlaying that with the type of business you want to run. Like, you know, for us, when we sit down, we don't have a bricks and mortar office. We, we go into a co-working space one day a week um, and there's 25 of us working predominantly from home. That's a very different, I suppose, 
client or employee value proposition than, than maybe someone who is used to going to 101 Collins Street in Melbourne and, you know, putting on a suit and tie. Um, so yeah. I think it helps for the people coming to the role, you know, having clarity and, and what they want. We also talk about like a reverse bucket list. And, and sometimes we start with that. It's like we don't know exactly what we want, but equally we just know what we don't want. And I would love it if people come in and, you know, they, they sort of see me sitting across the table and the way I talk and the way I act. And they just go, hey, look, don't take it personally, but um, this is not, Rising Tide's not the place for me. That, I mean, that's sexy to me for people to have that sort of confidence. Mm, absolutely, yeah. And I think the interview has to go both ways because otherwise someone's potentially setting themselves up for failure. But picking up on one of the things that you mentioned there, um, you said, I forget exactly how you framed it, but like you you got to attract good talent, then you got to deliver for them. What, do you, what would you say, you know, because I think you guys have done a great job of building a, a great culture in your business. What have been the top one or two things that you think when you think about delivering for your team to get the most out of them, but also make sure that they're super happy and pumped to, you know, fire up the laptop every day? What are the, what are the top couple of things that you guys do that you feel impacts the most there? I've reflected on this a lot, Nashi, over the years. And, and one thing I've learned is that I think when you ask employers and employees, they're probably not matching answers. But mm. what I come back what I come back to at Rising Tide is we've consistently run a business that I think feels like home for most people. Most of the time, we've provided opportunities for people to grow. I think our culture's got a lot better at helping people that are um, – that come from all walks of life to, to feel like they're heard. Um, and then it comes back to little things like we've just had a lot of consistency. You know, our leadership's been reasonably consistent apart from a couple of things we've spoken about. Um, you know, I think we, we lean into people, you know, when they need it. I think we're pretty good at, you know, I always say like you know, when everyone else is, you know, giving someone a clip, that's probably when they need a hug. And when everyone else is giving someone a high five or a hug, that's probably when they need a clip. And, and yeah. being really consistent around that. Um, and then also just trying to get better you know i think we've made conscious decisions along the journey we've been profitable so people know they've got a job people are clear that we're not here you know we're not here to sell to an insto tomorrow you know this is a, a lifestyle business but also it's you know it's a business that's going to be enduring mm. i like that it's, i think sometimes we can get caught up on the sexy stuff but the the, the little things are the, are the big things in a lot of cases and i think that making it a home um something that we sometimes take for granted but so important for people when you're looking for long-term team relationships. Maddie, what would you say? You, obviously, you've been at it, like you say, 16 years. You've gone from, you know, admin into advice into running the business. What would be the biggest thing that you um, didn't expect to be important but actually is? Oh, what is important that I didn't expect? For me... Personally, I, I was told this very early on in my career and it can be taken a lot of different ways. But for me, the way I took it, that I was told um, by a fellow called David Penglaze, who I haven't spoken to him for 15 years and he was a sales coach. He said, if you want to get stuff done, just do stuff. And for me, where my brain took that was, I, I feel like I always have made myself irreplaceable but not based on stuff that everyone else measures. You know, it is those like little one percenters or, you know, early days in my career was being really, um, you know, good with high level technology when no one else in the business was. And, and so I think, you know, the most important thing is just to have really good awareness, um, be really curious, don't take things personally. You know, everyone's coming or is generally coming from the right place um, and just be in a, Try to put yourself in an environment where there's room to grow, but there's also really good stability and people that want a mentor. I think that's that's probably actually, mate, take all that back. Having a mentor that wanted to mentor early in my career, I mm. think, you know, has probably moulded me, you know, incredibly um, as opposed to where I might have ended up. Yep. I think uh, it's a pretty fair comment, and I know through like Foxy, I think he'd mentored Brownie like early early days, and it's like that that circle of life uh, sort of continues. But you get switched on operators wanting to, um, you know, passionate about advice and wanting to actually 
give back and and help shape something that is enduring, as you say. Um, it's uh, you know it's sort of you got all the, all of the ingredients for for success there. What uh, what are you guys focused on now? What's what's coming up for you? Right now, we're working on on our sort of four to five year vision. And that's trying to, you know, one of the key pillars of our business is to try to make a less key person dependent, you know, get more efficient. And, and part of that, Nashi is driven by you know, a lot of our team, you know, have really been busting their ass for a long time. And, you know, some of us have young families like you do and, you know, trying to create something which doesn't drain everyone, but it also helps them to, you know, achieve what they want to achieve inside and outside of work. But continue to deliver to, to more clients without necessarily just burning the candle at both ends. I think that's what we're really sort of trying to focus on over the next couple of years. Well, mate, when you crack that code, if you could just give me the cliff notes, that would that would be amazing because I feel like that's the uh, that's the grail, work smarter, not harder, and, uh, you know, have the impact, but uh, do it in a way without flogging yourself to death. It's, um, that's where it's at. So I look forward to hearing about that on the next conversation that we have. <laughs> Yeah, I'll um, mate. I'll be selling that one if, um, if <laughs> yeah. I can nail that in the next two years. Uh, nice. My last question for you: if you could, if you could go back to you know bright-eyed, bushy-tailed self, uh, day one, and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Nothing is as good as it seems, and nothing is as bad as it seems, and just really focus on trying to work out who you are, and it'll all work out. Mate, I love it. Wise words there. Uh, I think we can, yeah, often build build things up, like you say, positively or negatively in the, in the wrong way. Probably not that helpful. So uh, I like that one. Matty, uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, great to see you guys smash it. And uh, yeah, as I said, I, I look forward to that next chat where I can get the gold. <laughs> I do too, mate. Thank you for having <laughs> me and, uh, and good luck to everyone on their advice journey. Keep, keep at it. Cheers, guys. We'll catch you next time.